Our scripture this morning uh, picks up uh, partway into the story where Jesus heals the sight of the blind man. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give, give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. The word of God for the people of God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. As Linda said, you are probably familiar with the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John under the name, Jesus Gives Sight to a Man Born Blind. It is a wholesome, sermon-rich chapter with many insightful life lessons. It would, in fact, take at least an hour and a half to cover the entire 43 verses in one sermon message. Aren't you glad that Linda only read eight of those verses? Amen. Well, <laughs> You will be even more elated to know that the message for this morning will focus on only one verse, verse 25. But this I know, I was blind and now I see. This wonderfully powerful one-sentence testimonial statement spoken by a simple, uneducated man has outlasted anything that the scholarly leaders of his time said or wrote. And I hope to use it this morning to talk to you about the power of a personal testimony, as well as the role that we play in bringing about our personal blessings. Now at the point where our scripture reading begins, Jesus has given sight to a man who was known to have been born blind. The unique thing about this particular healing is that this man was not seeking a healing, but he was given an offer, an opportunity for healing from Jesus. The fact that the man received the blessing of his sight without seeking to be healed is a sermon in and of itself. It has to do with what we Methodists call prevenient or preceding grace. Prevenient grace is a gift from God. In layperson's terms, it means that God loves us so much and desires so much 
that all of us should be saved. That before we are even aware of the need to be saved, God's grace seeks us out and awakens in us an earnest longing for deliverance from sin and death and moves us towards repentance and faith. The United Methodist Book of Discipline defines prevenient grace as the divine love that surrounds all humanity and precedes any and all conscious impulses. Now this grace from God prompts our first wish to please God. Prevenient grace enables but does not assure personal acceptance. We have the free will to accept or not. If we had read <clears throat> the verses at the beginning of this chapter, we would have heard that the man's healing was prompted by a question that the disciples asked. Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now that question could also be a life lesson sermon topic. How many times have you asked, why me? Why did I, what did I do to deserve this when some adverse situation occurred? But let's stay focused on today's message. But this I know for sure. Now seemingly in response, to the disciples' question, Jesus spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. Jesus told the man to go and wash himself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam, I'm sorry. The man went and washed and came back seeing. He accepted the offer. He did what Jesus told him to do, and he returned with his sight. Now one would think that such an event would have been a cause for celebration, but instead news of the healing only added more fuel to the frustration that the proud religious leaders, the Pharisees, had over the attention and adulation that Jesus was receiving from the people because of his preaching and the miracles that he performed. The Pharisees summoned the man, and after they heard his story, they still remained hard-hearted and refused to acknowledge that Jesus had performed a miracle. The Pharisees then decided to challenge whether or not the man was really born blind. So wanting to have them deny that their son was ever blind and thereby proving his healing to be a hoax and Jesus to be a hoax. The Pharisees asked the parents, is this your son? Was he born blind? And if so, how is it that he can now see? The parents confirmed that the man was their son and that he was born blind. But the parents were also aware that the Pharisees had threatened 
to excommunicate anyone who said anything to legitimize Jesus' gifts of healing or his claim of divinity. So the parents very wisely and probably God-inspired ended by saying, we do not know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. So the, par the Pharisees then interrogated the man for a second time, trying to force him to denounce Jesus. They said to him, we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And it was in reply to this lie of the Pharisees that in spite of all the threats and intimidation, the simple man who had received his sight spoke this brave and accurate testimony to the learned religious leaders. I do not know whether he is a sinner, but this I know for sure. I was blind, and now I can see. And therein, my Christian friends, lies the power of a personal testimony. You see, a personal testimony has the power to speak truth to power. A personal testimony speaks the truth of an experience. It is difficult to debate or dispute one's experience. I could not find the source, but I remember reading this sentence somewhere. People can argue with theories and speculations, but people cannot argue with experience. When we give testimony of how God has intervened in our lives, we help other people to realize that indeed God is for real, that miracles do happen and that prayer works. Most important, testimonies can inspire others to seek God and find personal reconciliation and peace. All of us, we all have a testimony. Our testimony is a part of the story of our life journey, a time when something so extraordinary, not just extraordinary, but extraordinary happened. Something so life-changing that you just know it had to be by the grace of God. I am reminded of a song that the choir at our Northern Illinois Conference United Methodist Church would sing. It says, when I think back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. And then, of course, it goes, testimony, but, but we won't go there. <laughs> that was in that church. <laughs> and now, if you would grace me with just a bit more of your attention, I would like to share a testimony from my life journey. Maybe it will help you to understand why I just can't keep this hand down. It just... 
from 1956 to 1960, I know for some, well, they may be out of here by now. <laughs> it's like in the caveman days. I attended high school in Chicago, Illinois. I lived in an area called Inglewood. My parents had moved to that neighborhood seeking better housing and better schools. During the time that I was in high school, there was a shift in population demographics in the area, going from Caucasian to Negro, which was the appropriate racial identity term of the time. The principal and most of the staff in the school that I attended were Caucasian. But by my senior year, a few African-American teachers were on staff. And one of them was Mrs. Lucretia Knight, an English teacher. I liked, I really liked Mrs. Knight, mostly because she seemed to like me. She complimented my writing ability and encouraged me to join the debate team. And besides that, my middle name is Lucretia. Well, in 1960, as my senior year proceeded, my mother became more insistent that I go talk to the counselor to see about college. Now, I'm sure that going to see the counselor seems to be the logical thing to do. But the fact of the matter was that the counselor never initiated any contact with us unless there was a disciplinary problem. So it must have been in about March or April of 1960 that I asked Mrs. Knight to allow me to go see the counselor. This was done in obedience to and in fear of my mother's ultimatum. You go see that counselor today or I will tomorrow. The counselor told me that college was very costly and that my folks would not be able to afford it. She said that because I was a good student, she would arrange for me to take the civil service exam for the post office. I left her office feeling quite hopeless, so much so, in fact, that I sat at a desk in the hall to wipe away my tears before returning to class. As I sat there, a man, and as I remember, a very handsome man, came walking down the hall. He stopped and asked why I was crying. I told him that I wanted to go to college, and I told him what the counselor had said. He then said, write down this address and write a letter saying that you are in the upper half of your class and that you want to be a teacher. I had never seen the man before, and I never did again. Remember now, I was a senior, a student leader. I knew everyone. At the time, I thought that maybe he was a substitute teacher. It was only years later that I asked myself how he knew that I was in the upper half of my class. Well, I wrote the letter in pencil on a piece of notebook paper, and I actually carried it around for a few days before mailing it. 
At the time, I had no idea where it was even going. I now know that it was mailed to the office of the regional superintendent of education. Time went on, and by early June, on the morning of my high school graduation, I awoke fully prepared to continue working in my part-time job as a cashier at the AMP supermarket to pay for me to take evening classes at one of the Chicago City Junior Colleges. As I sat in the auditorium with other members of my class, preparing to practice for graduation, for our graduation ceremony, the counselor came in and rather loudly was asking if Angela Sumter was there. Mrs. Knight stopped her, and while I could not hear what was said, the hand gestures indicated that it was a lively conversation. <laughs> As the counselor turned and rushed out, Mrs. Knight simply said, Angela, come up on the stage. You have a scholarship. I ran home at lunch to tell my mother. She was doing laundry. And I will always remember how her tears of joy mixed in with the sweat on her face. Some 20 years later, after I had taught high school biology for 15 years, had been blessed to be named Science Teacher of the Year in Chicago, had had students winning the state science fair and competing in the international fair, and had received a PhD degree and was working as Director of Minority Affairs at a community college. To God be the glory. I was at a Chicago City College for a meeting. As I waited for the elevator, I glanced at the directory, and there it was. Mrs. Lucretia Knight in the English department. I just knew that had to be my Mrs. Knight. My escort sent her a message, and after my meeting, I enjoyed a cup of coffee with Mrs. Knight, and she told me what had happened on that fateful day. You see, in 1960, in anticipation of a teacher shortage to accommodate the baby boomers that were expected to enter school by 1965, the state of Illinois had a program that awarded full tuition scholarships to students who would major in education. I don't know exactly how it happened, but because of the letter I sent, a scholarship award with my name on it was sent to my school. In fact, Mrs. Knight said that every high school was entitled to a number of scholarships based on the size of the graduating class. Recipients only had to be in the upper half of the class. In the week after graduation, Mrs. Knight had contacted other qualified students, and several of my classmates were also blessed. On hearing my testimony, some people have proclaimed, God sent you an angel. Others have asked doubtfully, you don't really believe in angels, do you? 
Well, the man who came to me as I sat in the hall did not have wings, nor did he have a halo. And he did not start the conversation by saying, fear not. <laughs> he just told me what to do, and I did it. I do not know whether the man was an angel or not, but this I know for sure. On the morning of graduation, I awoke with no money to pay for college. And before noon of the same day, I had a full tuition scholarship. I do sometimes wonder how my life might have been different if I had not mailed that letter. I had a choice, just as the blind man did. He was not a follower of Jesus. He really had no conscious reason to trust this strange man. He could have just wiped the mud off and continued to sit where he was. But he accepted the offer. And by doing what he was told to do, his obedience was rewarded. As I have grown older and wiser, I do not wonder as much. I just pray prayers of thankfulness and praise God for his grace. The blind man honored his blessing by refusing to denounce Jesus. I try to honor my blessing by remembering that to whom much is given, much is expected. And it was because I honored this pledge that I received another major blessing in my life. I was contacted some 34 years ago and asked to participate in a high school graduation type program. I really did not want to go. It was uh, on Sunday afternoon, it was in June, and I really had other things I wanted to do. But I remembered, to whom much is given, Angela, much is expected. Now who would have thought that Dr. Theodore Davis would be sitting in the audience as I was speaking, and that he heard a whisper, there's your wife. And so 34 years later, I'm blessed to be with the love of my life because I remember to whom much is given, much is expected. In closing, I would ask that you remember that God is not partial. He offers blessings, love, mercy, compassion, peace, and salvation to all who would receive it. God knows your needs better than anyone, and he has promised to supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory, meaning he will supply you with what he knows is best for you when you choose to trust and obey. The word of God for the people of God. O oh, gracious and most loving God, we have come to worship and we depart now to serve. Lord, we grant, we ask that you would grant us your peace and that while we are apart from each other, you will be in the midst of wherever we are. In the name of Jesus, we do pray, amen. <laughs>